Okay. Good evening, folks. Very glad to have you here. Very glad to have you as part of this course. Um, this is Art Appreciation. If you're in the wrong place, that's okay. You can still come and appreciate art with us. So uh, I'd like to begin with a brief word of prayer, and then we will launch into this evening's introduction. So let's, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for today. God, for uh, this day that you've made, we rejoice and are glad in it. God, right now we ask that you would be with us as we begin our exploration of the world and of your created order uh, through the gift of art in all of its various forms. God, I ask that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit, um, help us to see things through your eyes. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, how I'd like to start this evening is just to give you a, uh, a quick uh, introduction of myself as the uh, instructor and then to uh, go over the, uh, the course schedule as such and then to offer just the briefest of brief uh, introductory lectures. So just so you get an idea of how these courses will uh, be run, I tend to do my classes earlier in the week, uh, my Zoom sessions, and I usually treat them as basically kind of a, a pre-lecture to the week, giving you kind of some of the highlights of what's coming. I don't cover everything because it's very difficult, particularly as we get on in the, uh, in the week to cover everything in the, uh, in the textbook. And besides, that's why you have a textbook and that's why you get to read the textbook uh, so that you can, so that you can catch part of that. So uh, a little bit about myself. I have been teaching uh, for all said and done for about 13 or 14 years. And I have spent the last um, 10 and a partial year as a lecturer here at Central Christian College. Uh, in addition to my work as, a, uh, as an academic, I'm also a clergyman. I'm a bishop in the denomination called the Communion of Evangelical Episcopal Churches. And uh, it's my great uh, honor, privilege, joy um, to uh, humbly serve the body of Christ um, through, through that ministry. So uh, one, of the, one of the great things I find of, about uh, being able to be at a school like Central is uh, the ability to be exposed to a wide variety of things. So one of the questions I get fairly frequently um, when it comes to the arts and humanities classes is uh, why do we have to do, why do we have to take arts and humanities classes? And particularly for those of you who are doing these online degree programs, um, you, you are not getting degrees in art, you're not getting degrees in music uh, or anything that's necessarily related to that. Um, the reason that we do it is because we offer a liberal arts education here at Central Christian College, and that means that uh, you literally get exposed to the arts as part of your academic experience here. And I am, uh, have been blessed to teach not only art appreciation, but also music appreciation, uh, as I have a background uh, primarily in music. Oftentimes when I get to travel uh, around the world, uh, people ask me, what do you wanna do while you're there? And uh, my, I usually have three pretty, pretty, um, three or four statements that are pretty at the ready. It's, I want to see churches, especially if we're in a country where there's a lot of, of old historic buildings. Uh, I want to see art. I want to eat food and I want to drink coffee. Those are kind of my, my four big, uh, four big things. So, uh, when, uh, when I happen to be, uh, in Rome back in 2014, I got to do all of these things, and um, sometimes it was almost in the same building, uh, which is which is pretty remarkable. 
uh, when I've been to Germany and to Austria and to the Czech Republic and to Israel, uh, to Mexico, all, all across the United States from uh, literally coast to coast from, uh, from Florida all the way out to Hawaii. Um, I've got to do all these things and the art has been a large part of that. Um, and so as you are going through your experience here, uh, not only in this course, but maybe in some of the other courses that you have to take that you're thinking, now why on earth do I need to take that in order to get this kind of a degree, um, whatever you may be in. I'll, I'll give you the story that I tell a lot of my classes. And that is, um, I heard this story told by a journalist years ago, and he was uh, going up to the uh, high rise office of a, of a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And uh, they were going to like go to lunch and this journalist was gonna interview the CEO. And so he went up to the CEO's office, you know, corner office looking out on, on the city. I think they were in New York or Chicago. And the, uh, the CEO had a couple of last minute things to finish up. And so he told the journalist, I'll be right with you if you just wanna have a seat over uh, in those chairs, um, we'll get out of here in a couple minutes. And so the journalist starts, uh, he sits down and you notice there's a magazine rack. He starts flipping through the magazine rack. And there's magazines there ranging from you know, some of the stuff that you might expect from a, from a, a middle-aged man. Um, there's like hunting and there's golf and fishing, and wildlife and, and car magazines. But then you start seeing stuff like quilting and needlepoint and scrapbooking and stuff that just seems out of character for this guy. And so as he's flipping through the pile, the journalist looks up and he's like, um, all these magazines, do you, do you read all these magazines? And the... Uh, the CEO said, well, yes, I do. And he's like, do you have an interest in all this stuff? And he said, no, not really. And he said, well, then why do you read all this stuff? And he said, well, because the people that I do business with are interested in all these things. And so I read this and I learn about it so that we have something additional to talk, to, uh, talk about other than just business. So my challenge to you is that maybe as you're working through the arts courses uh, here at Central, whether it's art appreciation and music appreciation uh, or uh, art survey course uh, that maybe God will in his providence will use that knowledge uh, as you're dealing with people in the future whether you intend to be in business um, some kind of a, of a leadership a ministry just any number of things um, in my own life uh, as an academic as a as an educator and as a as a clergyman um, I've found that being able to speak about everything from theology to quantum physics uh, has been very helpful. And so um, there's nothing quite like being able to connect um, with somebody over the inner workings of a 1967 GTO uh, and then turn around and be able to talk to somebody else about your recipe for, um, for Irish soda bread. So it kind of it kind of ebbs and flows a little bit. Uh, another thing I'll say is that usually when I do these Zoom sessions, I don't typically have my camera on because I a lot of times have to run um, media on this side and I want to dedicate my computer's processing power um, if I'm wanting to show videos and stuff like that to actually playing the video and not you seeing my face. You can see the still image of me there. Um, if you really want to know what I look like. So, and I am running two accounts simultaneously for whatever reason um, on my primary account, uh, it would not let me record. So I had to double log in. So there's not two people in this class named, uh, named Mac, either both me, it's just the, the way in which I had to do it. So the overview of how um, the course is going to go just to briefly um, skim over the um, the syllabus and I won't belabor it because it's all online and you can read it. So my main points that I, that I want to bring up is do keep to the, um, do keep to the schedule. Uh, so for this week we have readings of chapters one and two. Um, there's the pretest, the plagiarism, certification, um, the discussion, and then as well, the application and the assessment uh, or test for this week. And that's gonna be pretty standard throughout all the, um, all the weeks that we go through. Some will, will vary a little bit, but most of your weeks are gonna have a discussion application 
uh, a test of, of some kind. Uh, if you have specific questions on the discussions and the applications as we go through the weeks, um, do make sure that you, uh, that you contact me. Uh, you can email me, um, ryan.mackey at centralchristian.edu, and, and I will do my, my best to get back to you just as quick as I can. Um, the other thing that I would, I would go over you, with you right now, um, just in this format, is the, um, is the critical analysis um, project, the eyes to see. So uh, this has kind of um, a multi-part, um, multi-part, uh, multi-stage process here. So the, uh, just to read briefly from the syllabus, it says your final submission for this course will be a critical analysis project on an artist or piece of artwork. So you have your option, artist or piece of artwork. So it will include both a paper and then a PowerPoint presentation. So the main idea here, um, and you don't have to look this up, but um, this is uh, from Ezekiel chapter 12, verse two. It says, son of man, you are living among a rebellious people. They have eyes to see, but do not see, ears to hear, but do not hear, for they are rebellious people. So the idea that it's possible to go throughout life and not see or hear that the idea that a lot of times we, in this day and age, um, in the in where we are at in the 21st century, there's so much that is out there, whether it be um, videos, whether it be images, whether it be sound, audio, uh, tactile, there's any sense, you know, like smells, um, there's any number of things that just assault our senses day in and day out that sometimes we can almost become numb to it. And so one of the things that we want to do in this is focus on what it means to, to see, especially as it pertains to art. So this idea that first and foremost, um, straight out of the gate here, um, we're working on having eyes to see and ears to hear. So you can be looking um, for an artist or a piece of artwork. So photography, painting, decorative art, architecture, um, iconography, anything that's mentioned um, in our textbook that strikes your fancy, you can do that. Um, so begin researching, start taking notes. And here's the idea, the main idea. So you're gonna introduce um, your artist or your artwork. Um, you can start, and again, this is just in the, um, in the calendar, sorry, I'm flipping, flipping pages so I know exactly where I'm, where I'm calling from. Uh, so in uh, week three, so the week of uh, week three, which begins uh, the 8th of May, uh, your thesis statement is due. So start thinking about um, three strong points about your subject, whether it's an artist or particular, um, particular artwork. So for example, um, in the syllabus give you, um, there's a, um, there's an, a micro sculptor named Willard Wiggin. He talks about traumatic experiences had during his childhood and during his childhood, he would skip school and he began to hide and focus on smaller things in, in life. And so he began to sculpt these little micro sculptures, these tiny, tiny sculptures as a way of self-expression. And in the, uh, trying to, sorry, I'm skipping, skipping on the websites here now. In the, uh, and my screen froze. Okay, there we go. Like I said, the reason I'm not running a video is so I can get more of my, more of my horsepower over to the, uh, over to the computer itself. So when you're, when you're trying to find out about this, consider asking these questions. Who's the artist or what is the piece of artwork? What were the circumstances that led to this? Um, discuss maybe the medium used or if you're dealing with an artist, discuss their legacy. And how did this work affect you? And why did you choose it? Or how did this, 
um, how did this artist affect you? So there's, there's this um, emotional level that a lot of art connects with people on. And, and I'm hoping that you, that you get part of that um, as a result of, uh, as a result of this paper, as a result of this um, assignment through here. And you can read um, more about this um, as we, as we go along. So uh, one of the things um, that I actually shared with another class just earlier this evening is I am actually teaching two classes um, on Tuesday evenings online right now. So both just started today, this Tuesday. So as a result, um, these Zoom sessions will be about 45-ish minutes um, just to, I, I have to use the same Zoom classroom for both. And so in order for me to clear the classroom, uh, just like you would a standard classroom, uh, I've got to end the session pretty promptly so I can get things um, set and ready. So um, forgive me, but that's, that's the nature of it this semester uh, or during this session for me. So what I would like to do is uh, offer just a, a brief kind of introductory lecture explanation, um, introducing art appreciation and uh, welcoming you to, to this course. And as soon as my PowerPoint jumps in, maybe, it's the waiting part that gets me at times. Okay, let me share my screen here. It's coming, I promise. But then again, so is Christmas. There we go. Okay, it's about time. All right. So when we talk about um, looking at art, there's a few things that we need to be aware of from the get-go. And this goes back to what I mentioned just a few moments ago, um, the verse from Ezekiel, where it says people have eyes to see, but they don't see. People have ears to hear, but they don't hear. And I'd like to suggest that maybe there's a difference between looking and seeing. You know, as, um, as I've watched um, my friends who, who have children, my wife and I don't have children yet, but as I've watched my friends deal with their children, and as I've watched my relatives deal with my nieces and nephews, um, and, you know, the, the parents will say, look at me when I'm talking to you. And just because a child looks at you when you're talking to them doesn't mean that they're necessarily paying attention. It's just like my students when I'm, when I'm in class, or again, I've, I've observed it in, in interactions with small children, that you'll be talking to them and they won't be paying you any mind. And so you finally have to say, listen to me. Sometimes grabbing their faces and looking them in the eye so that they see you and so that they're listening. So it's, it's a little bit of a shift. So when we talk about looking versus seeing, a lot of times we need to talk about this idea of observation. So it's something that takes effort on our part. As I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon for people when they go to an art gallery, you know, you can have uh, hundreds, 
thousands of pieces in an art gallery. And a lot of times you're not seeing the whole collection because they've got stacks and stacks and stacks more of art in their archives. It's impossible to see it all in one go because they won't let you in to see a lot of it. Even places like the Louvre in Paris or the National Art Galleries and the Metropolitan Museum of Arts in like New York City or in uh, Was or Washington DC and in New York City, you can't see everything. It's not all on display. But those pieces that you do see, those, those moments where you can observe, where you can take note of things, where you can maybe see things that you didn't see before, you weren't aware of before, that you hadn't observed. I'd suggest that there's a difference between a passive viewpoint of art and maybe an active viewpoint of art. One that requires us to take time and to devote attention to um, engaging with art. Now, I, um, in, a, in an effort or a, um, opportunity of full disclosure, so my uh, degrees that I have are either in theology or in music, in ministry or in music. And as a composer, um, my, my main art form is in musical composition, um, as well as I've, I've drawn and I've done art for years since I was a kid. As a composer, though, it takes time for people to engage my art as a composer, because a three minute long song asks you for three minutes of your time in order for you to get the entirety of it. A piece of art, a piece of visual art is so much more in a sense. It takes, uh, it can take more time. I mean, I'm, I'm turning around and I'm, I'm standing in my office in, in Kansas here and I'm looking at, at uh, four pieces of art. Again, I said I'm looking, looking at four pieces of art that are on one of my office walls, three of which were done by um, my wife's cousin who is an art professor at Montana State University Billings, and then one piece that I did. And then I look over a little bit and I saw one that one of my students did for me. All really fun pieces of art, um, and all that as I've looked at them time and time again, I noticed something new about them. I have um, uh, Christian art on my wall. So next to my screen, in the direction that I'm looking at all of you, or looking at, at the screen to, to engage with this, I have, um, I have a, an image of the Trinity, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I have one of Jesus enthroned in heaven. I have one of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples uh, at the Last Supper. And above my, my desk, I have a, um, a screen printing of a favorite group, a uh, group called the Milk Carton Kids, and it's done in this old school... Um, uh, printing style, uh, a poster that looks like it harkens back to like the 1940s and 50s. Um, it's done through this older process. I've got a relief carving on my wall of, of the Last Supper. I have a, a lot of Christian and religious um, art on my wall. I've got uh, a wrought iron cross. I've got a hand carved wooden cross from Ethiopia next to it. I've got a pearl inlaid or a mother pearl inlaid cross from Egypt. Another one that's from Assisi in Italy that's attached to my, to my computer screen. So there's like bits of art all around here. And yet every time that I will take focused attention and see it, something that's active, more of it is revealed to me. I go in deeper. So we're going to take a moment um, and give you about 30 seconds just to look at this piece of art. Now, you don't need to answer out loud. This is a rhetorical question somewhat. The question is, what piece of art is this? And the answer that you can all give me before I even uh, 
answer it myself is the Mona Lisa. Great, but it's a trick question. This is not the real Mona Lisa. This is the Islesworth Mona Lisa. This is a different version of the Mona Lisa. Some think that this was actually an earlier version that Leonardo da Vinci did. It's not the actual Mona Lisa that we're used to seeing. There's the Mona Lisa. What I don't have, unfortunately, I forgot to put a slide in with both of them side by side. But here's the Islesworth Mona Lisa. You can see the face, the hair, dress, the hands, the setting with, with the scenery in the background. And there she is. Again, face, hair, dress, hands draped, and you can see the base of a couple columns within the background. So the idea that we can look at a piece of art, if you're staring here at the Islesworth Mona Lisa, and you're like, oh yeah, I know that one is the Mona Lisa, but it's not the Mona Lisa that we're thinking of. There she is. And you probably made some observations about this one. You know, maybe the colors are a little bit um, on the darker end, you know, the, the deep kind of metallic colors in the sleeves, um, the kind of blacks and earth tones, shades of gray and white, um, a little bit of uh, abstract in the, in the background. It's not as, as defined versus when we look at the Mona Lisa itself, we get the signature smile, we get a little bit more definition in the background. We can see some land, some trees, the road here. Um, you can see again, kind of the folds in the sleeves, the wrinkles in the sleeves um, and around different parts of the dress, a little bit of waviness in her hair. So when we're looking at pieces of art, um, we want to learn to see, we want to focus, be more intent. So there's our Mona Lisa right there. So one of the things that we need to be aware of within um, the context of art is uh, the different methodologies and the different ways in which artists go about their work. So there's, there's a nice statement in the textbook um, on page five. It says, Leonardo wrote in his notebooks, moderated light will add charm to every face. And he used um, an effect which he called sfumato lighting. So it's this soft lighting. It's kind of what we would typically call like a candle lit or candle light lighting. And you can see how in the Mona Lisa's face, how it's this very diffused look. Um, they use it in movies and television shows a lot of times to help soften the face so that people's um, features are not so angular um, and so that there's less shadowing, um, like harsh or unstartling shadowing on the face. So we have to be aware of the, um, the techniques that people use um, their rationale behind using it in order for the art to make more sense. As a side note, just because I think that this is an interesting little tidbit, and you can see this uh, as well on page five, there's a sketch by da Vinci called Drawing of Flowers and Diagrams. And if you look at the handwriting of da Vinci, you might notice something unusual about it, and that is that it's written backwards. It's written from right to left. Da Vinci was left-handed. And so he would write his notebooks, the notes in his notebooks, he would write them backwards. So you had to hold them up to a mirror in order to read them forward. Another thing we need to be aware of is um, the historical context of this artwork. So first off, the art itself, what, what, is, the, um, what is being revealed in the piece of art? So um, same page in your text, I like the first sentence under the heading. It says, great art reveals the spirit of the age in which uh, that produced it. So when we look at a piece of art, we need to know what is going on in the world around, around that time period in order to greater appreciate it, which then ties into the artist. So what is going on in the life of the artist? What are they involved with? Why did they make this particular piece? What would be the issues or the life, um, 
life changes, lifestyle, life, you know, what is going on in their country, what is going on in the known world that would cause them to do things in such a way. So a couple weeks ago on PBS, uh, PBS is a very popular uh, station, very popular channel in the Mackey household. We actually saw a documentary on da, 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 Leonardo da Vinci. And one of the things that they pointed out was Leonardo da Vinci was one of the first people in the Renaissance, uh, beginning in the Renaissance, to do detailed drawings of the human anatomy. Everything from the exterior, the physical body, such as his Vitruvian man, all the way to he worked with um, local artists and doctors and um, undertakers to document the different parts of the interior anatomy. So he's dissecting the body and drawing these very intricate uh, diagrams of what uh, the human body looks like and what makes us tick from the inside. And it's this age of exploration. It's this age of discovery. You've got people like da Gama and or, uh, Vasco da Gama and Balboa, and you've got Galileo. You have all this scientific um, discovery that's being done. You've got music that's coming out left and right and gracing these huge churches. You have all this that's going around. And in the midst of all that, you have a man that they call the Renaissance man, the man who's able to engage in all these different activities and all these different things. And so Leonardo is a really interesting, and it's not just Leonardo, but Leonardo's uh, the jumping off point for a lot of people. Da Vinci is truly a man of his time. And so understanding the world in which he lived, the time in which he lived, is just as important as when you fast forward to the 20th century and you start looking at people like Andy Warhol or Jackson Pollock or, um, or Matisse or even into the latter part of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century with people like Banksy. Um, you need to we need to understand a little bit more about the context surrounding uh, these people. Another big point uh, of discussion would be art and culture. It's not just a Western thing, um, a Western culture thing. This is uh, all cultures. And one of the big things about art that you're really starting to see in the last hundred years is people around the world are starting to appreciate the artistic works of their people, regardless of their nationality, as treasures, as national treasures. Uh, I remember years ago watching Antiques Roadshow and uh, this gentleman brought in what ended up being like, a, I believe it was a Navajo woven blanket. And this was back in like the mid, late 90s, early 2000s. And the, the appraiser was just floored. Um, he's like, this is, this is practically the holy grail of this kind of stuff. And he said at the time um, that, the, that this blanket would have been um, valued at a, at a half a million dollars. And he, he, I remember the, the appraiser said, what you have here is a national treasure. This is part of our um, cultural heritage in the United States that needs to be preserved in some way, shape or form. So whether you're talking about um, works in jade stone that are so valuable now in, in China, whether you're talking about indigenous um, American, Native American art um, here in North and South America, whether you're talking about the Aboriginal art in Australia, or um, some of the great pieces of art that are coming out of Eastern and Western Africa, there's so much that ties to culture that we have to be aware that it ties into the identity of a people. It ties into what makes them tick and uh, who their sense of what their sense of self is. And a lot of times people can look at a piece of art, even if it's something that they themselves did not do, that they themselves did not paint or sculpt uh, or draw, and yet they can find themselves in that work of art and say, that's me, or that's my people. Um, as somebody who's, whose family has been here for a little bit, um, I can look at some pieces of art that are part of my cultural heritage and find some kind of identification with them. Um, I am the third, and my mom's family, I am the third generation 
uh, since coming over from the old country, which is Ukraine and Germany, uh, my great grandfather came over. And so um, I'm just that close removed from, um, from being, from my family being immigrants. And to look back at some of the art that was coming out in the late 19th century in that part of, of Eastern Europe, it would be really easy for me to say, hey, that's part of my cultural identity. That's part of my heritage. That's, um, that's pretty amazing um, to, to tie into that and to get that sense of who I am uh, or part of who I am from, from that cultural marker. Obviously with, this, with us being at a Christian college, um, one of the big things that we would focus on, and rightly so, is this idea of religion, faith, and belief being expressed through, uh, through art. And one of, the, one of the phrases I like um, from this first chapter in the textbook uh, is that art has the ability to communicate specific spiritual messages. Now, that's not just Christian messages. Um, this would be seen in um, the art in Buddhist countries, such as the, you saw the Amida Buddha uh, in the previous slide. Uh, it could be uh, Native American um, uh, drawings and such. Uh, earlier this year, I was at an academic conference on uh, uh, arts, the humanities and social sciences. And uh, the first lecture I went to, a gentleman gave a very fascinating lecture on uh, cave paintings in Nevada, Native American cave paintings. And it was, it was quite fascinating to see the development of this and to see how their belief system was played out there in the rocks in the, uh, in the Nevadan desert. Um, and to kind of get the sense of a, of a people finding and discovering themselves and telling who they were through these, what we would consider to be very crude, cryptic um, artwork. And yet there it was um, pretty plainly in a lot of cases uh, to be seen. So there's also the communal value. So what is this piece of art communicating about, um, about a people group? And there's kind of two parts to that. There's, there's this kind of folk side and then there's kind of this ethnic side. So like if we we're talking about folk art or folk music, um, it could be that which represents like the common people. So um, folk, folk art could be something that would, would be representative of, of people of a particular nation or region or something like that. But then ethnic art would be to go down a level and identify with a specific people group within, uh, within a, a folk tradition. So you could talk about folk art of the United States, and then you could talk about art that was specific to uh, the Appalachian Mountain regions or to the American Southwest, uh, like New Mexico and Arizona, or specific schools um, within the United States that have a particular style that they work in. All that can go together into defining a communal value. Now, within this, you learn about the values, you learn about the, the rights, the ways in which things are done within a community. You even learn about how they interact with God or with um, the universe or spirits or, or something to that effect. Uh, as, a, as a clergyman, uh, as a theologian, this is often of interest to me is to see how people communicate what they think about God or what they think about religion in general through visual images, through artwork. Um, you know, it, to, to see how God is represented is, is a very common subject. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite things to do, particularly as we've just gone through Lent um, and Holy Week, is to see different interpretations of Jesus being crucified and um, what the, the, the passion, the crucifixion, uh, you know, the judgment by Pontius Pilate, and, and to see different versions of that. So um, several years ago, I did a, a composition uh, of concerning the crucifixion of Christ, and it was a multi-movement piece. And to, so to accompany that, I found 
several images of different versions of the crucifixion of Christ. And it was really interesting to, to research because I found, you know, the, the stereotypical, you know, fair skinned, almost kind of blondish haired Jesus. Um, I found uh, the more Middle Eastern as Jesus may probably looked a little closer. I found uh, Jesus depicted as a Hispanic as um, I found one group of, of paintings that was really beautiful. It was from a cathedral in Ethiopia and it showed Jesus in uh, the traditional garb of a, of a specific uh, tribe of people there in Ethiopia. And so, uh, you know, Jesus is of a darker skin color. And then to go over and look at um, uh, in Asian cultures and Jesus is, is lighter skinned and has almond shaped eyes. Um, back in 08, my wife and I got to go with a group of people to Israel and we went to Nazareth and there's this church called the Church of the Annunciation. It's got this huge courtyard. And all around this courtyard is um, are different paintings and mosaics of Luke, of Luke chapter 1, where the archangel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, um, Behold, thou wilt be with child, um, and uh, you will bear a son, and you'll call his name Jesus. And it depicts that moment. And again... They had some that came from uh, from Inuit and uh, Aleut uh, Native Americans. They had ones that came from Japan, ones that came from Uganda, ones that came from Australia. And Jesus or Mary and the Archangel Gabriel are just are just displayed in all these different manners. My wife's looking all around the courtyard, and she just began to tear up because it was so beautiful to see all these different expressions. Uh, of the same faith and realizing that um, it's the same God over all of us, you know, um, regardless of, of what our, our background or our cultural identity is, he's the same God overall. So, sorry, that, that's just, I get excited about that. So that's, that's kind of my, and I have the same. Okay. Um, along with that would be, and I've, I've got just a couple minutes left here. Uh, so I'm going to try and buzz through a little bit of this. Uh, along with this would be such things that we would identify as tribal tribal art. So like the cave paintings that I mentioned a moment, a moment ago, which you also see um, there on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, you see a lot of masks, whether you're talking uh, Native American cultures in the United States, whether you're talking uh, South American cultures, uh, whether you're talking some of the African cultures where they use masks as part of different rituals or religious ceremonies. Um, all these kind of factor in, you have the totems. Uh, particularly, again, to go to like some of the Native American cultures here in the United States, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, um, you start to see that um, those kind of artworks and what they say about uh, about people. Um, we were watching again PBS, and and they showed a totem pole or part of a totem pole, and if I recall correctly, they said that the way that this was built is that when the chief died, um, that they would remove a particular part of the totem pole, uh, and then they would add in when the new chief, I believe it was when the new chief came, um, came in as part of it. Um, something else that's often out there is um, the use of tattoos. Um, you can see this in like uh, the Maori people. We saw a little bit about of this when uh, we were at this academic conference. Uh, earlier this year out in uh, in Oahu uh, in Hawaii and seeing some of the uh, the native art expressed through different types of, of tattoos, uh, different parts of the body, including the face, um, which a lot of times those tattoos are, are almost like fingerprints. They're identifying marks um, and they are, are made specifically for uh, a particular person. So religious art is, is a large part um, for me of, of why I even am interested in, in teaching a class like art appreciation and being able to look at um, art through the lens of, of faith. So this is obviously seen through a lot through paintings, um, whether they be murals like um, the ones done by Fra Angelico in the um, Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi uh, which are very beautiful, 
or whether you're talking about um, uh, Russian Orthodox iconography, or whether you're talking about uh, even some of the more contemporary pieces uh, or middle 20th century by people like Werner Salman, uh, there is this um, tie in to paintings, not just paintings, but drawings, uh, even as well, sculpture. Um, about four years ago, three and a half years ago, it'll be four this year, I got to know a uh, Christian bronze sculptor by the name of uh, Rip Caswell. Uh, he's from Oregon, if I recall correctly. And he was down at a retreat center um, just about an hour away from my home. I was on retreat with a, a close family friend, uh, a fellow priest and I, uh, he and I were down there for a retreat. And uh, we happened to meet Mr. Caswell and he was there for the dedication of a new sculpture that he had done at this Catholic retreat center showing the risen Christ. And it was really interesting to get to talk with him about his art and how his faith um, as, as a Roman Catholic brother influenced um, the way in which he interpreted it was uh, Christ rising from the grave and, uh, or the, uh, Christ ascending, excuse me, and how his interpretation of scripture and theology influenced that. Um, obviously there's also architecture, the, the photo that's shown here at the right, this is York Minster Cathedral in York, England. I actually took that back in February. Um, I, my wife and I were in York as I presented uh, at a conference on uh, church music. And one of the cool things is we got to go to that building uh, for evening prayer and worship uh, every night. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And again, to see the way in which people talk about God or what they, what they say and think about God through those kind of means, um, such as uh, the architecture and such. So, okay, well, I have taken it uh, just a little bit longer than I was intending. So uh, I'm going to end this evening like this. Uh, if you have uh, questions I can answer over the next couple days as you're getting your footing with the class, please don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out to me. My email address, again, it's, it's in the syllabus, but it's uh, Ryan, R-Y-A-N, dot Mackey, M-A-C-K-E-Y, at Central Christian, all one word, dot edu. Uh, it is my pleasure to, and my honor, to be with you on part of your academic journey. So uh, I'll close with a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed for the evening. So gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for, um, for this class, for, this, uh, for these students. Pray that you would um, guide us graciously through these next several weeks as we endeavor to learn more about you through the gift of art. Pray that you would guide our thoughts and our conversations, and may we see uh, the world through your eyes, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, and again, um, reach out and let me know if I can be of uh, help in trying to define some stuff for you or, or give you a little bit more help in that direction. So God bless you all. Have a great day.